Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Glad you can join us today. We are going to be looking for the Holy Grail. Yeah, we're going to look at the legends and the myths of the Holy Grail. We're going to look at the earliest historical accounts of the Holy Grail. And we're going to look at all the candidates that may actually be the Holy Grail. So why don't you pull up to the round table and come in search of the Holy Grail. Guys, I'm excited to start this episode. Father Rich, Ryan Shield, how you guys doing? I'm fantastic. I've always been fascinated by the Holy Grail ever since Monty Python <laughs> came out. My <laughs> uncle showed me that movie a long time ago. The yeah. opening scene with the clashing coconuts. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. African swallows. And the yeah. African swallows. And the uh, killer rabbits. And the Knights of Knee. No, for me, <laughs> for me. Knights of Knee. The Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Oh, yeah. Uh, when that movie came out, I was pretty young. But that movie just, it changed my life. And it made me just absolutely fascinated with uh, the understanding of Christian relics and the archaeology behind them. Uh, that movie really impacted me as a young kid. And, um, I mean, could you imagine a movie like that being made today? How cool that is. But a major movie with Harrison Ford and Sean Connery looking for the chalice of jesus christ i mean that is a that yeah. movie man it's one of my favorites ever mine was goonies goonies we absolutely treasure. goonies Just, was good too it's, it's, i mean indiana movie. june's the crusade the last crusade is kind of that like was, goonies yeah. in search of the, of the holy, holy grail. grail it is right and it's true i mean the pop culture that surrounds the holy grail whether it's the knights of the round table whether it's the humorous monty pythons and the holy grail and then Ooh. and then most certainly indiana jones which was definitely and, one of my top favorites and a lot of the crazy you know, really stupid theories of like Dan Brown and books like Holy Blood, mm -hmm. Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. um, they're fictitious. So they're, they, they have license they're totally to totally gnostic, you know, bad readings of it, just yeah. meant to sell books. But uh, we're going to look at the true history of the search for the Grail today. That's exciting. That, that is, is exciting. Yeah. But it's like National Treasure. I mean, what's, you know, National Treasure is kind of pulling on similar sentiments and yeah. creating intrigue around mm -hmm. these artifacts of our country. Same kind of similar similar yeah. style. Yeah, but I don't think it has the same theological impact that these other theories have, where they're trying to pass off the Holy Grail as not really the the cup used at the Last Supper or sure. the cup that caught the blood from the side of Christ at the crucifixion. Instead, they're trying to say, "Well, this is proof that's undermining the Catholic faith." So yeah. that, that's why I see the big difference. And in for that. a number of uninformed people, I could see how it could be misleading for yeah. sure. Yeah. All right, so you know, before we get on our horses and go galloping off uh, to the misty <laughs> Avalon, that's right. You need to search in your search bar for the Catholic Talk Show, and when you do, <laughs> you'll find our website, you'll find our YouTube channel, and you can find every single way that you could listen in or view this show. We want you to continue to support us in prayer, most certainly. And for those of you who are considering becoming one of our patrons, we have wonderful incentives, coffee cups, hoodies, and a lot of other cool items that we want to express our gratitude to you and all of our patrons for supporting the show so we can reach new markets. So we really appreciate it. And a big shout out to all of our Patreons. And as we get started, make sure that you're following us on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and all of us as we go into the search bar. If we put in, where is the Holy Grail? What's the top pick there? Well, I think before we get into really- The Catholic talk show. It is. The Catholic talk show. Yeah. Because it's right here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so actually, uh, you know, we've, we've been talking on this show for a long time about Father Rich's unicorn chalice, and he's mm -hmm. been so kind to actually bring it in. Yeah. Uh, let's see. It's actually, where it's a very that? beautiful chalice. It though. is. There's Gilded in Germany, unicorn. 1932. You're oh, my that's... grandparents' birth. Wow. And it was given to Father Joe Fusco, who built St. Anthony of Padua in Ozone Park, Queens, New York. And his nephew, it was left to him when he passed away. And his nephew was a part of a Curcio movement in Southeast Florida when he retired. And uh, I spent a lot of time with those Italians. So this is a, a very, very dear chalice to me. It is a dear chalice. <laughs> <laughs> a deer uh, that longs for running streams. Wow, your chalice has almost as long of a provenance as the actual Holy Grail. <laughs> Impressive. Yeah, yeah, it's very special. All right, so let's let's jump into, I guess, the 
the grail legend and the archaeology and the, the theories behind it. Now, because there's a lot of legends out there's there. There's a lot of legends, and there's three, possibly four legends. And I really want to, on this episode, focus on one, which I, and most, I guess, real Catholic Grail scholars would say is the most likely. Now, are you a real well, Catholic Grail scholar? I'm a real Catholic uh, Grail yes. scholar. <laughs> no, I stand on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> no, man, like, I, you know, there are certain things like the cross, right? And and these are mm-hmm. these are things that were <laughs> like the relics of the church. They were preserved. Sure. These are these are real relics in our church sure. that are, have been preserved. Mm-hmm. The Grail, you know, it, it, honestly, like theoretic, you know, theorizing about mm-hmm. this stuff mm-hmm. is great. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, is everybody thinks they got it. Oh, for when sure. They find it, anybody because finds a chalice in the dirt somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's it's like, gotta be the I, holy got, grail. I got the Holy Grail. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, come yeah. and pay thirty dollars to come into my museum and check this out. And that's out. why it's across the board. And that's why yeah. I do love uh, Indiana Jones, The yes. Last Crusade, yes. because there are so many Mysteries. chalices, right. so many grails out there that that it's it's covered in mystique and mystery. Yeah. And that's the beauty of our faith because. It amplifies the sense of search. I mm. want to go and search. Yep. I want to find what is most probable. I want to really get close to the discovery of the true, true grail. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder, this I could wonder, have been a, this could have been a uh, inquisition, but I wonder if- Save uh, it for the inquisition if, then. You if, could be the inquisitor today. Do you want to be the inquisitor? Okay. Yeah, let's let's hammer him up. It's on. a good question. Well, right. now the, now the anticipation is yeah. going to kill me. I'm getting it's nervous really already. Question. All right. I mean, I think it is. <laughs> we'll see. You might have an easy answer for it, but it won't we'll be the first the time I've been embarrassed. Well, first, of, first and foremost, I think a chalice that was uh, entrusted to Jesus, to the apostles, would be something in line with what I would think because of how this chalice was entrusted for to sure. me. So now they here, would have been all over that. Yeah. Like it would have been uh, something that was held into the highest regard. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if you look at even that movie at the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, uh, the Nazi drinks out of the one cup and he's like, picks a very ornate cup and he drinks it out of it and he turns into a skeleton and dies. Mm-hmm. Right. Is that the condemnation that Paul talks about <laughs> when you go and receive unworthily? Possibly. That's a, that's, <laughs> that's a nice turn into a skeleton. I, I don't think Indiana Jones is actually proper theology. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. But, uh, the night's like he chose. Poorly. He's an academic though. He's yeah. An, yeah. And then, in, and then Indiana Jones drinks out of the old ratty cup, and he's like, this is the cup of a carpenter. Yeah. Actually, I think, and this is, I think that first guy actually chose probably more accurately than Indiana Jones. Than what it actually would have looked like. I, I think so. Yeah. So the context of the cup of the, of the Holy Grail is... Would be the Jewish Seder. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that ha- this, this Not Holy a big Grail, old stem on it like yeah. that. The Holy Grail would have been the cup used at the Last Supper, which was a Passover meal. Yeah, a cup of blessing. Yeah. And at the cup of blessing in a Passover meal, there's a couple cups on the table. There's the cup for the wine that people actually drink. But the cup of blessing is known as the uh, Kiddush cup, right? Mm-hmm. And this is typically the most ornate piece of... Kiddush cup? Kiddush cup, yes. Oh, Kiddush. Yeah. This is like typically the most ornate cup <laughs> of the table setting um, for the Passover meal. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I mean, I know that today when we have a holiday, we don't just put serve always on paper plates and solo cups. I mean, look, when it's Christmas, you bring out your good Christmas and Thanksgiving and Easter. You bring oh. out your good your good dishes and your good cups. It would have been no different for the Jews of the first century. They would have had nice cups. They wouldn't. Number one, you'd never serve wine in a wooden cup. That's ridiculous. It'd just soak it into would it. Absorb, yeah. Yeah, they're not going to do that. They're smart. Dude, I've, I've been to the Delacrosse house many, many times, and I, we've had some festivities, but I don't remember any fine china being broken that's out. That's because all my bowls are missing. <laughs> well, you got six kids, man. You can't. They, they, eat, they eat cereal out of the bowls, and then I can't find them. <laughs> It's like a sock. They're like their socks or their shoes. No, you they're, know? they're eating cereal and then they're like doing like a toast. Like when like they smash the wine glass, they finish their cereal. And like, uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't have nice dishes at my house. I've got yeah. one. Right. Well, so but you we're... keep it in a, in a treasury box. Right. It's not even that nice anymore. <laughs> so the cup used for the the cup of the blessing, which would have been where our Lord instituted the Eucharist, and He would have held it in His holy and venerable mm-hmm. hands, mm-hmm. the whole thing, would have been that cup of blessing, and that would have been the nicest cup on the table, and mm-hmm. probably the nicest cup of the family that provided for the uh, accommodations hosted, of the last supper. Yeah, hosted the the that last supper in the upper right. room. So. 
when popular culture or the modern mind thinks of what the cup would have been like, they're like, no, it wouldn't have been fancy. Well, Indiana Jones got that wrong. And as much as I love Indiana Jones, that part of it would almost certainly have been wrong. It would not have been the cup of a carpenter because Jesus wasn't traveling around. And even the Gospels in uh, Luke 22 tells us that they weren't making their own dinner accommodations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our Lord sent out Peter and John to find the man carrying the jar of water who would prepare the upper room. So they weren't they weren't carrying around a sack of their own dishes. Yeah, and right. my impression of Jesus was that he was truly deeply founded upon a nomadic style of life, which meant you wouldn't be carrying a lot of you know luggage with you, not a lot of baggage. Right. You know, you don't want to bring that extra tunic. You don't want to bring you know an extra sack of, of you know whatever you collect along the way. Baked beans. <laughs> baked beans are a necessary thing, though, because it's good at protein. can of baked beans. <laughs> <laughs> Fish sticks. Roll that beautiful bean footage. <laughs> Oh yeah, man. Trump's I'm serious. It's, it's, fish, it's, real, man. it's really fish. It is. It it's, really really is. it's real fish. <laughs> Just eat it. It's real beans. <laughs> fish sticks are real fish. Just eat them. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so this would have been a, a, a likely a very ornate cup, and it would have been provided for that person who the family of that person who was carrying that jug of water. Now, mm -hmm. we're gonna, this is where the Grail mythology diverges. We know that they celebrated the last. The Last Supper in where? And I know you guys have both been there. Where did this happen? It's the upper room in Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah the cynical. And, yeah, through the through the uh, gates of Zion. I mean, it's on top of that beautiful hill next yeah. to the church of the Dormition yeah. where, where Mary, one of the traditions is held that she was, you know, went into that door mission or the assumption mm -hmm. into heaven took yeah. place in that uh, in that region, which mm -hmm. has a beautiful tie in, you know, theologically and then also prayerfully and spiritually, that that is precisely where she would have been mm -hmm. kind of uh, assumed into mm -hmm. heaven. Body and soul. Right, yeah. right in the same it's place that like Jesus disappeared or something. Yeah, that, that Jesus offered the bread and wine. And yeah. there we are experiencing first and foremost the transubstantiation of these yeah. beautiful gifts of bread and wine into the true body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Like it was there. What's in that, that room same like? place? The room's powerful. What was your What was your experience? My experience well, there was a lot of people moving around in there, and you know, the church didn't really enshrine it and consecrate it as a chapel. Or well, they're not know. allowed to. I know. I know. They're not allowed to. Right. I, I know. And it's been <clears throat> rebuilt. It was actually rebuilt in right. the 11th century it, by the it Crusaders. It just to me just didn't really. It, it didn't rock my world like oh. you know like Gethsemane did, mm -hmm. and um and then the, <clears throat> the you know some of the areas in Capernaum, mm -hmm. uh and um. I guess the physical, I mean, they had rocks everywhere, mm -hmm. right? It's like you go to a place, it's like there's a rock. Mm -hmm. That's the rock that Jesus was near when he, he was sat on or whatever. Mm -hmm. right. There's a rock he sat on when the angels ministered him in Gethsemane. There's this, you know, rock where he was born, you know, and then you get to this mm -hmm. room and, you know, I mean, I, I just didn't have a really overall, like a very spiritual experience there. Mm -hmm. The Dormition I did, it was a really beautiful place. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think it, it kind of shows like the sacredness of it is not, there in terms of the church, uh, you know, making it into a chapel. A, a and typical prayer Catholic in. experience right. of is, walking it, into like a basilica. Right. Or you think of the the church that the hands of St. Francis himself right. rebuilt. Built. They built a humongous around basilica, yeah. you know, the San Angelo, the, the beautiful mm -hmm. church around yeah. it. So you would expect almost the Catholic church to do something like that. But they can't. And and, and it's like going into like a, a, you know, a room or if, if you rent it out for a party or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you, you know, know and I, that's and, what they did. This and is the most. Right? Didn't they do that? They they, 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 they got they got the room, a party you know? hall. They, it, it's, it's a party it's, hall. It's true. Well, my my experience was I I showed up in Tel Aviv. I was so taken by Tel Aviv and the and the ancient city of Jaffa right there. You know, I, I spent like place. two extra days. It was my first trip there. I was by myself. I was coming from India for about a month, and I was praying. And I, I wound up meeting this couple, and they invited me to to go with them to Jerusalem. And when I went to Jerusalem, I got off the Sharut. And I was walking around kind of aimlessly and um, prayerfully, and it was on the Shabbat. And um, that's why a lot of the public transportation wasn't wasn't up and running. So I met this this group of people because I didn't know where I was going to stay, and I didn't have a lot of money. And just followed someone carrying a jar of water. And I had, no, and it was really these, <clears throat> these uh, Germans that showed me to the Swiss House of Hospitality, <laughs> which was only like 45 shekel or something like that. Yeah. It was nothing. 
And they brought me there, dropped me off. I checked in, paid, dropped my bag. And then I was just so amped about walking to the ancient city of Jerusalem. And I walked from the, the house of hospitality all the way up through the gate that is now that I know is the gate, the, the Zion gate. Mm-hmm. And I, the very first church that I went into was the church of the Dormition. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. You just bang it right there and go under that overpass. Amazing. So yeah. I prayed there for a while, had a very powerful experience similar to what you yeah. had Delacrosse. And then when I went out, I, I went, turned the corner and it was just like I was being led to it without any type of tour guide and went right into the cenacle, right into that room. And it just so happened that nobody was there, bro. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it was like I had the whole room to myself yeah. and I could go back there anytime in my mind and my, and my prayer. Yeah. And it's like, I'm there. And it was just like the quiet. And I could totally understand if I think as a priest too, it's a very different, I mean, like the, the, the spiritual like connection that you have with the Eucharist is yeah, pretty, I mean, that's where the institution of the priesthood happened. Yeah. In that I mean, room. that's mm-hmm. like, I mean, I, I can imagine you having an yeah. experience there. And I sat down up against the wall and I just absorbed this beautiful sense of like, man, I'm, I'm being drawn into this mystery. Mm-hmm. And this was at a time where I was really struggling to discern, like, am I actually, can I do this? Can I live celibacy? And, yeah. and is Christ indeed calling me to this? And the upper room was a, a, an additional contribution to overcoming some of the apprehensions that I had because I felt like I was I was yeah. welcome and invited at the table. And um, yeah, it was just it, it's you know like that stonework and the coloring of the room yeah. that hasn't been doctored by any type of you know extra ornamentation. It's just like simple stone. Right. Well, I mean, the state of Israel and the Vatican have been in a long contentious debate over that site. And it's probably the most important site in in, the, in all of Christendom that is not uh, under the control of the church. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's under <laughs> Israeli control. It's under Israeli control because below that is the believed to be the tomb, tomb of David. David. Yeah. But the upper room was rebuilt by the Crusaders in the 11th century. It's pr- it's not. I mean, structurally, it's the same place, but the room has been completely redone. Redone. So a lot of, but you know. The concept that David is buried below, but a lot of scholars would say, actually, this is it's the tomb of a crusader who wanted to be buried under that site. Because mm-hmm. again, that tomb is another is an eleventh century mm-hmm. addition. So mm-hmm. But that that hill in respect to Jerusalem is an important hill. And it's one of the it's one of the I believe the large the largest peak in mm-hmm. the Mount Zion. Mm-hmm. And so when you when you think about that too, even in respect to to King David, where he was on more of a descended area of Jerusalem and a fortified area of Jerusalem, you know, where people are buried sometimes of, of importance and notoriety are in elevated locations that they build stones around and, and leave stones. And if you think about that, and, and what I loved about it was I went underneath and I prayed in David's tomb with the men because they, they kind of segregate men and women of a place of prayer because they don't want to, uh, you know, be distracted so, you know, I, I went over with the men and, and, um, and I prayed and as I was meditating there, I mean, just think about, you know, the Jewish custom of placing stones and rocks mm-hmm. when you're mem- memorializing the dead. Well, those stones built up around David and David's kingdom up to the King of Kings, you know, who's not only going to unite the North and the South, mm-hmm. he unites all nations and it's built upon David's kingdom, which yeah. I which I just love, and that's where the true first last supper mm-hmm. was, and uh, where the Holy was Grail, celebrated. and where the, the Holy, Holy Grail, Grail was used. Back to the Holy. Well, let's Grail. go back to the Holy yeah. Grail. That the cynical actually, the the, the the Vatican still maintains that they own it, mm-hmm. and Israel took it over in the 1967 war. Uh, the Vatican uh, says, "Look, we bought this in the 13th century. We have the deed. We have the record of purchase." Uh, but then the Ottomans kicked us out. It's ours. Bad, uh, the Israel says no. So under contention. But this is where the history from this room is where the 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 tracing the grail and finding where the grail is That's today diverges yeah. from here. Yeah. Now, there's three, four possible theories. And I'm going to go over three of them very quickly because mm-hmm. uh, they're not the ones I want to focus on because I don't think they're the most likely. Um, Who theorizes about this? Are these like historians, authors, authors mm-hmm. tradition? All kinds of people. Mm-hmm. And there's hundreds and probably countless traditions. Now, the first tradition is that that room was actually under the ownership of St. Joseph of Arimathea. 
and that after the crucifixion, uh, when he would have collected the blood from the side of Christ in this cup, uh, Joseph of Arimathea was driven out and he went to England, um, mm-hmm. traditionally attested to that St. Joseph of Arimathea fled to England. And that that's he, why Monty Python did his in England. Right. That's, that's, and that's, that's and a lot of one of the legends. That's, that's the one of the legends. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the Grail <laughs> mythology um, centers around that. So if you're looking at like King Arthur and the search for the Holy Grail and Percival and all these people who wrote Ooh, these that's interesting medieval legends, it would kind of follow this track that mm-hmm. Saint Joseph of Arimathea brought it to Glastonbury or buried it under Rosalind Chapel or in Mount Saint uh, Mount Saint Michel in France, right? Or which is essentially Avalon, right? Uh, and a lot of the grail theories become that the search for the Holy Grail now becomes more of a spiritual quest and the cup is kind of inconsequential, but it is the reward of this spiritual pilgrimage. Pilgrimage. What <clears throat> is your quest? Right. To seek the Holy Grail. Now, the, what is your favorite color? <laughs> Blue. Blue. No, green. Right, clear. <laughs> so then... Um, but that church and that chapel, that kind of trace of that provenance, was destroyed by Cromwell during the, uh, you know, the English Reformation. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I, st- I think that one's kind of unlikely. There's another theory out there that there was a cup that was traditionally venerated, and, and if you look at some of the, the last accounts of Christians before the Islamic conquest of the Holy Land, and like when it's still under Byzantine control, you have like uh, Arnulf, and you have the. Um, uh, the anonymous pilgrim who wrote the last accounts of what the Holy Land was like before it was destroyed in the Islamic conquest in the 6th and 7th centuries, they said there was a cup venerated at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It was silver, which was kind of attested to the, um, by St. Jerome, who said on, that, yeah. that the cup was of silver, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but they say it was silver and agate, so mm-hmm. stone, mm-hmm. right? Am- so Like emerald or something like that? Agate. Was that? Agate. Okay. Agate or onyx, one of the two. And then that cup, when then after the Islamic crusade, um, I'm sorry, the Islamic conquest that was taken by the Sultan and the powers of the Egyptian Muslim forces, and that it stayed in their possession kind of as a, as loot. And mm-hmm. that after the the Moorish conquest of Spain, um, there was a famine there, and some uh, Christian, uh, a, a very wealthy Christian in northern Spain. Um, provided some food and some funding for the starving uh, the starving Muslims in in Spain and North Africa, and in in gratitude, the they gave this cup to him, and that's called the um, that cup is called. Let me think here, the Chalice of Donna Erica, right? And that's still a cup, and there's a big book written, but again, that theory's pretty sketchy and mostly mm-hmm. conjecture. Um, Where's Leon, Spain? I see some. Yeah, that's that's about. this one. Okay, that's this one. Now, then, there's the other theory that the cup never left Jerusalem, and that the Crusaders, when they took over the Temple Mount, they actually found it underneath the Temple Mount because the Temple Mount has just caverns and labyrinths oh, it underneath does. it, and they found it there. It's fascinating. And they took it with them back to France, and mm-hmm. that was. Uh, they're kind of the big treasure they found and what pro- allowed them to become the most powerful religious mm-hmm. order. They did this archaeological kind of excavation of of some of the drainage uh, channels underneath Temple Mount, mm-hmm. and I've walked through there, and you see some of the largest stones that you'll ever see in your life, and how these were moved and how these were placed is still a modern marvel that nobody really understands. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a fascinating place. So you could see how things would be hidden underneath Temple Mount yeah, and, right. and very, yeah, very the, easily. The Ark of the Covenant was mm-hmm. there and, mm-hmm. um, you know, the menorah and all that. The Ark of the Covenant is fa- was found? No. It okay, was. That, that's, 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 an, that's another show. We but should the, probably do a show mm-hmm, on that. We should. But now to the theory that is probably the most well-attested. There's actually a document supporting it. And the one that logically makes most sense, and I think the one that this episode should hinge on, is the... The, the I call it the St. Mark theory. Mm-hmm. And so in Luke, when Jesus sends out Peter and John, I think that's a really important note on why uh, this theory is, is so kind of plausible. Uh, and the reason is because St. Peter is one of those people. Mm-hmm. And they said, Jesus said, go and find the man carrying the jar of water. Now, did Jesus mean just go... F- find some dude carrying water and just follow him to his house and say, hey, we're going to have dinner here. Yeah, go search, find, right. and, and realize who is carrying the, the water. Right. So this, this would be that St. Peter and St. John went and they saw 
someone they recognized, and that was St. Mark. And St. Mark and St. Peter are were incredibly close. St. Mark was like his secretary. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is mostly considered to be the actual words of Peter as recalled or written by Mark. Um, and Peter would have recognized Mark and be like, oh, there's Mark carrying water. This is what our Lord meant. And that being a friend of the apostles and a disciple of Jesus, he his rich family, because if they had a large upper room, meant they had some money. I like that tradition. So it would yeah. have been Mark's play. It would have been Mark's, right. Mark's family's, family's house. Place. You right. know, Mark's family's place. And Mark's family would have provided graciously their best their best cups and mm-hmm. their best food for the preparations for the Passover. Mm-hmm. And that St. Mark's family owned the upper room. Mm-hmm. Now, why is this part of the grail theory? There's a very important thing is that Mark and Peter were very close friends. They, he was the secretary of Mark. And after the crucifixion, how did the, just some random cup from some meal uh, stay in the possession of the church and the apostles? Well, St. Mark would have recognized how important the institution of the Eucharist was and as his friend, he would have given this family treasure, this heirloom that Jesus had celebrated the Last Supper to St. Peter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, well, know. when you think of everything that's leading up to this one celebration of the Passover that Jesus is celebrating, and he's expressing to his apostles all of these you know, insights to what he is going to accomplish, it... it you know, you think about any type of trip that you make to Disney World, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to get some memento, you know, and right. that's just a, a foolish trip to Disney World. Or especially if you go overseas and you visit a nation that, you know, you you know, you would grab something to share that with people that you love. I could see, you know, this is a pilgrimage of three years that these apostles were on with Jesus. And this is a very significant moment going potentially you know, and, and, and legend to the house of St. Mark, you know, and his family house. And that would be a very, very significant Passover meal. And, um, you know, without a doubt, the cup of blessing would have obviously been identified for many, many years. And obviously Peter, something St. Peter would have wanted to keep and Mark would have graciously given to him. So, uh, so where does the grail then go from there? Mm Mm-hmm but goes to Rome with St. Peter. Mm -hmm. And St. Peter would have been celebrating Mass using this cup, this Mm -hmm. agate cup that he got from St. Mark's family, who owned the Cenacle, who provided for the preparations for the Last Supper. So St. Peter, after his crucifixion, would have handed it to Linus and Cletus, and Anacletus would have passed it on to, you know, each pope successively. Mm -hmm. So that's how it stayed in the possession of the popes, the early popes in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you wonder like the like the first thirty whatever popes were martyred, mm-hmm. yeah. and the circumstances around that. Obviously, you can get into all of them, but you know, it, it's during that kind of persecution. You wonder if you know they weren't found in you know celebration mm-hmm. of the Eucharist and the well, Roman and that's the thing that's just it, destroyed I agree, everything. Delicrosia. You know, I mean, there's yeah. like there's so many circumstances. Obviously, we know the power of God can can prevail in this you know, mm-hmm. pres- preservation, mm-hmm. but, um, the, the, the odds are stacked against an, an organization, you know, holding on to something like this for 200, whatever years, 300 mm-hmm. years through terrible persecution, terrible right. persecution. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and that's a, that's an important point because the way that I look at St. Peter, I mean, one, he was imprisoned, right? He went through a lot of different things. Did he have the chalice with him the whole time like yeah, that? Because, you know, the way that I look at my life, I, I receive things that are very, very valuable, very uh, Special, you know, treasured in the spirit. Yeah. But a lot of times God will have me pass it on to mm-hmm. somebody else. I think of a divine mercy rosary that, that I received and then was blessed by John Paul II that I prayed with for years. Mm-hmm. And it turned color in Medjugorje, turned to gold in Medjugorje, a very deep treasure of mine. And then God just, uh, you know, inspired me to 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 give it to me. Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't even remember. I honestly don't even remember who I gave it to. It was just like in a moment of like clarity, like I need to, I need to give you this. So, you know, I look at Peter, you know, similar to like, even with you, Delacrosse, I kind of look at him strong leader, you know, businessman, um, you know, entrepreneur and sees, sees the wonderful opportunity of investing his whole life, invests his whole life, you know, very, very conscientious of what he's doing. But he's also the type of guy that's going to lose his uh, power cord, you know, and like 
you know, like and, and not have not, not <laughs> well, have his other. I, so it's just but, like but, I don't think he has possession. Like you know, I have possession of everything. Like this morning, you were like, "Where's my son? Where's my glasses? I, did I right. leave them at the house?" Yeah, you but know, I, mean, I just, just I look at I look at Peter. I look at Peter similar to that, where right. he has a sense of detachment. Right. He doesn't. It's like his only attachment is in relationship to the Spirit, in relationship to the person of Jesus, and that's always how I've kind of seen his his personage. Yeah, and another thing too is Saint Helena mm-hmm. when. Uh, Constantinople, the Edict of Milan made Christianity legal, or they were, began practicing and 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 structuring themselves around places mm-hmm. and gathering mm-hmm. in communities and things like that, because you know they were all underground. Um, that that allowed for the the conscientious effort of 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 drawing things and pulling mm-hmm. you know articles together mm-hmm. for the purpose of edifying the church, mm-hmm. right? And so. St. Helena actually t- undertook this. And, and so uh, I don't recall anything found in, found in Rome, mm-hmm. right? She went to the Holy Land. That's right. But so, that was her commission. But, but, mm-hmm. but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is in Rome, mm-hmm. those times people mm-hmm. were, you know, hiding, exactly. uh, you know, like they were being killed. Like this was not, um, this was not like, Hey, you guys shouldn't be doing this. It was like, Hey, grab them. Yeah. We're gonna kill them. Yeah, and take all their stuff. Exactly, and a singular it. moment, like I need to be up and gone. Like I, the church isn't yeah. thinking like, see, but that's preservation. Where, like that's just my yeah. theory. But there may right? be sentimentalists in that in that and group. That's, that's right. like that they're collecting uh, and yeah. they're treasuring because that's more of their personality. Right. That's the way that I look sense. at it. That see, sense. but that's where this theory actually has the most credence. Saint Peter, I know he was, you know, kind of a. <sighs> live by the seat of your robes type guy. <laughs> but this was the cup of the Last Supper, and this was the cup of the institution of the Eucharist and given to him by Mark, and do this in remembrance of me. I think St. Peter can handle, do this in remembrance of me and have that cup yeah. and treasure it. Now, he certainly met his martyrdom in 65 to 68 mm-hmm. A.D., but he passed that on. That would have been to the community in the, in the house churches. And he would have passed that on to the second pope, St. Linus. Mm-hmm. When he was being arrested, he knew it was coming. Linus wasn't arrested. Linus would have known where all the cups were stored. I mean, do you, Peter wasn't carrying it in his pocket when he was arrested. Mm-hmm. Linus would be like, oh, no, Peter got arrested. Let's go get all the cups and all the important things, right? Mm-hmm. That's what any reasonable person would do. Mm-hmm. No, the tradition is that that is exactly what happened and that these cups, this cup was passed on from Peter to Linus to Cletus to Anacletus and to all the subsequent popes of early Rome. So this cup would have been probably the most important artifact and the most important singular article of the early church of Rome. And this is attested to in tradition and in documents. Mm -hmm. Now, you are absolutely right, though, when you talked about persecution, because that church was under constant persecution. Mm-hmm. And probably maybe the most bloody and terrifying persecution was the Decian persecution of 250 to about 270 AD. And the most famous martyr of that persecution was probably the, one, of the, one of the greatest martyrs was St. Lawrence. Mm-hmm. And St. Lawrence... You know who St. Lawrence was, right? Deacon. Yeah, he was deacon. And he was he was grilled. That's right. And he yeah. said, and he said and I, I just love I love that. <laughs> I love that story, man. Crazy. The levity of humor in the middle of his martyrdom. He was like, I'm done on this side, flip me over. <laughs> you know, I love that. Yeah, St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence was an amazing martyr, incredibly brave. And the I guess the the story around his martyrdom was that the Pope at the time was Pope Sixtus II, mm-hmm. right? And he had been arrested and executed first, mm-hmm. and that the the persecutors and the and the I guess the the police and those executing the persecution uh, went to Saint Lawrence, who was the deacon, and it, you know obviously the deacon of the church controlled the wealth of the church and the distribution of alms to the poor. He was essentially the the purse master of the church, mm-hmm. right? And they went to St. Lawrence and said, you have a, like a day or a couple days to round up all the treasures of the church and deliver them to us. Mm-hmm. So what did St. Lawrence do? He went and he went back to this prelate with all the poor people, all the poor Christians of Rome and said, these are the treasures of the church. And, the, and which number one is the truth. The treasures of the church are, are the poor, are the suffering, are the people that the church has the charge to guard over. 
But that doesn't mean that there weren't actually treasures, that, that the cup and the robes and candelabras and any of the things that were important weren't physical goods. So what would a good deacon have done? He would have taken all of this wealth and given it away. So, look, this is going away. So we got money, give it to the poor. We have this, we have food, give it to them. We have any vestments, what do we do with them? We have any um, you know, chalices, what do we do with them? So this chalice, St. Lawrence, in that distribution, according to this legend, and this is attested to actually in a few documents, gave it to a Spanish soldier, a Spanish Roman soldier, and said, guard this with your life, because he knew that he was going to be executed and these things were going to be destroyed, sold, or lost. So do we know who this Spanish soldier is? Like where, you know, where he is today? Is he like buried near well, the chalice? Dead, but is he, is he, is he in the cathedral? You or? know, I wasn't able to find the name of the Spanish soldier that St. Lawrence entrusted the, you know, these treasures of the church to, to prevent them from being destroyed in this persecution. But we do know where these treasures ended up. And we kind of, we have a list of everything that St. Lawrence gave to him. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And yeah. this is all found in the cathedral of Valencia. Mm -hmm. So to this day, the tradition is that this Spanish soldier took it there and it passed through a couple kings' hands because that's what relics typically did in the Middle Ages. But typically, the relics always have like an inscription and like a letter of authenticity that comes with it and mm -hmm. signed by multiple people. Did this relic have that type of uh, a passage of any sort? Well, so what accompanies it still to this day and is stored in the reliquary with it was is a very ancient document on, written on vellum, which is lambskin. That is vellum? Vellum. 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 That's what they wrote, at the, wrote ah. on on time. Is that vellum? Vellum. That's, that's nice. Is this vellum? <laughs> so with the cup in the reliquary is this ancient list, which is essentially an inventory list of the treasures that St. Lawrence distributed. So and multiple this, treasures that St. Lawrence treasures. distributed. Right. But this cup is on that list so that it's stored. What else is it. on the list? Uh, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't get into you it. didn't read the vellum. I didn't read the vellum. You got to read the vellum. What kind of Indiana Jones are you, <laughs> man? You didn't read the vellum? Look, I lost I lost dad's book. It was taken by the Nazis. So we have to go into the heart of the beast to get the book back. Nice tie-in. Yeah, I know. Okay. You so, redeemed yourself. Thank you. So uh, some of the references after that, it was found in the inventory of the treasury of the monastery of San Juan de la Pena. Um, then it had passed over to uh, a couple kings and whatever. Mm -hmm. And eventually there was a, one king or, or duke or whatever, and he, he borrowed money from the church mm -hmm. and put the cup up as as his collateral and couldn't pay the church back so he just gave the cup to the church and that's why it's still in the cathedral of, of valencia but there's a long provenance a long history of tradition and if you go to valencia today you can still see this cup now this cup another thing that's really interesting is um so there's that long tradition of popes of the early church in rome celebrating mass of this but you know who was actually also celebrated a mass using this cup John Paul II, John Paul II and, and Benedict XVI. Yeah, right. When they went to Spain, yeah, they right. actually celebrated Mass using this cup. Mm -hmm. And the idea that the popes of the 21st, yeah, 20th and 21st cool. century are using the same cup that was from the Last Supper and St. Peter and Sixtus and Linus and you know, Anacletus and Cletus, that's mm. powerful. That's what I love about celebrating Mass with this chalice is that one, it was it was given to a priest that precedes me, mm -hmm. and it was entrusted to me. So I, I cherish it, and I am not the only priest to use this chalice. Yeah. And as I, when I pass away, this chalice will go to someone else. Mm -hmm. And that I love that fact because it's beyond me and the importance of me. It's the importance of what is contained in the chalice and what we serve as priests. Namely, yeah. that we celebrate the divine mysteries of our salvation, that Jesus's blood was poured out for the salvation of man, mm -hmm. and that his atoning sacrifice is what atones for our sins. So when it comes down to like the specific chalice, I have to reference the Eucharistic prayer one, because the Roman canon identifies when, when the priest takes the chalice in his hands in the rubrics and says, similarly... In this way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, and then the words of institution. So, But I love that reference. He took 
this chalice. So it's the priesthood of Jesus Christ in persona Christi when the priest is celebrating at that singular moment and saying the words of institution, it is this chalice. And that's so you're an, doing it with this thing over here. Yeah, it's it, just it, kind of yeah. somehow mystically it's drawn into awesome. Jesus taking this chalice. Mm-hmm. So the the mystery of our salvation is rooted in the action of the blessing cup of the kiddush, mm-hmm. and, and and in that same reality we're entering into that sacrifice of the upper room, and that's why the passage of these sacred vessels and holding these sacred vessels to be very very important. You know, we went through a period of time where like, well, I I don't want anything precious or ornate. I don't want, you know, like, and we should have wooden chalices, clear glass chalices, chalices, things that can easily be destroyed. And, you know, I'm glad that we moved out of that phase, you know, and, and back to a sense of, hey, this is something that is lasting through the test of time. Mm -hmm. This isn't a trendy thing. This is absolutely entering into eternity. You know, this is the eternal, timeless sacrifice of Christ, God mm-hmm. from eternity entering in to our human temporality. And there's something that should be marked in that and passed on from every generation. Absolutely. Yeah, that's it's a beautiful cup, too. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, this cup is still there. So, are you talking about my cup? Or well, yeah, this is a beautiful, beautiful cup, too, too. <laughs> but the, the, the chalice or, uh, of Valencia, it's, um, it's, it's gorgeous. It, so, it looks like this. It really it does. does. Yeah. But where this upper cup would be made of red agate, about three and a half inches tall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the the bottom part of it would have been added on later, and then mm-hmm. and, and scientists yeah. examining it know that this the lower part, the stem and the base were added mm-hmm. on later. And the top cup, though, mm-hmm. the really interesting thing that also lends way more credence to this particular theory is that the top cup is made of red agate, which is a material that was very highly prized in in Israel and Egypt, Egypt and Palestine. Palestine. But the style, the mm-hmm. age, the manufacture, or the, the the technique to build it, build it, carve it, or whatever, mm-hmm. were very typical and consistent with the way that cups of agate or bowls would have been made in the third century BC to the first century AD in Palestine and eastern Egypt. Mm-hmm. So the cup has a consistent provenance. It has a very plausible story. The cup itself is scientifically tested to be of the same make and material would, that would have been typical. It's in the shape of what a Kiddush cup would have been. Mm-hmm. Everything that goes along with this lends in all of my, in my belief that this is the Holy Grail. Wow. That we know where mm-hmm. the Holy Grail is, and it is actually in the possession of the Catholic Church. Mm. And that is incredible. So obviously the pearls yes. and the stones would have been added mm-hmm. on. Absolutely, yeah. Just that, and we, let's, Just Kyle, the let's put shape. a picture of this up on the screen here. But if you're looking at it right now, you can see the top part of it, that red part, that is the original part. That's the part that would have been passed on, made of stone, passed on from, from Mark to Peter, uh, used at the Last Supper. So the handles, the stem, All of the those things are added, added on later. Yeah. Absolutely. That's cool. It's a beautiful cup and that Pope Benedict and Pope St. John Paul II have used it and that, you know, it's just, it's an amazing thing. And I am, I'm confident that if there is any cup in the world that is the Holy Grail, this is the cup. Oh, wow. Now, one other thing that I think is important about the whole search for the Holy Grail, you know, some people say the search for the Holy Grail is a spiritual journey or it's for the relic of the last cup. but you know, and these these knights would go on these fantastic journeys through mountains and battle dragons and, you know, it's Roman persecutions and everything, but... And killer rabbits. And killer rabbits and all kinds oh, of things. Long sharp. To Look find, at the bones. To find this cup that was said where that was for the institution of the Eucharist mm-hmm. um, because it held the blood of Christ at the crucifixion or held the, the transubstantiated blood of Christ at the Last Supper. But you could find the Holy Grail every day of the week down the street mm-hmm. from you. Mm-hmm. If you go to your local church, every single cup on this earth that is used in the institution of the Eucharist and the Catholic Church, to me, is the Holy Grail mm-hmm. because it truly, and in every way, shape, and form, holds the actual blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that is what the Holy Grail is. So that chalice that your priest raises up on Sunday mornings, that is the Holy mm-hmm. Grail. And, and it is a journey. It is a crusade. You do is. have to fight back the demons and the <laughs> and the dragons and the killer rabbits and the people that stand in the way of your progressing toward that mm. moment of faith. Yep. Because what I love about Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is that that pitfall that he's, he's facing before he goes into the room where he meets that crusader and he... The leap of faith. The leap mm-hmm. of faith. And it's like, what is that leap of faith for you? And how are you journeying to that point of recognizing that when the priest is holding the chalice, it is Jesus saying he took this chalice. That's right. You know, and and that does take an act of faith. It does. And if you believe in the true presence and you believe that that is truly the blood of Christ, you should be making it to your local parish to receive that cup with the fervency of the Knights of the Round Table, yeah. the Knights Templar, or Indiana Jones searching for the Holy Grail. And because nothing it's there. is going to get in the way of that journey. And yeah. nothing's going to get into the way with that type of, of quest. Yeah, and you don't have to ride on a horse through the desert and face, you know, booby traps and jump over, you know, leaps of faith or or anything like that. Uh, you don't have to guess and get turned into a skeleton. Look, the Holy Grail is in your church. So the historical mm-hmm. Holy Grail, I do truly believe that it is the, the, the chalice of Valencia. But every single church in the entire world where uh, the, the words Eucharist of institution happened, by a validly ordained priest, that is, is the Holy Grail. Being celebrated, that is the Holy Grail. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that's the, the moral of the story. The Eucharist, that is. The, the blood of Christ is the source and summit of our Christian faith. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Without it. Not, none of this Christianity would be here. Mm-hmm. Zero. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's the source, yeah. right? So everything yeah. flows from that. Mm-hmm. All goodness from God flows from that. Mm-hmm. And when we think of sacred vessel and how we would go at great lengths to protect and pass on mm-hmm. what is entrusted to us, there's no greater sacred vessel than the human person. Yep. And God desires to commune deeply with us, but he allows us and our own freedom, whether we want to take that quest or not, whether we want to take that journey or not. Yep. And, you know, we may not be fighting, you know, the sense of dragons or what Sheil was saying, but spiritually we are. And yep. to and to keep in mind that you don't let anything get in the way of your practice of faith and exercising that faith regularly, not just on the weekends, not just Sunday, but regularly exercising your faith in relationship to these divine mysteries. Absolutely. All right, you ready for the Inquisition? All right, so... Here this is the Inquisition, where Ryan Delacroix is, my first time. is the Whoa. Grand Inquisitor. Whoa. This is going to be interesting. If you get in trouble, let me know. I can come in. Uh, okay. I can at come the in. Last what if supper? I get in trouble? I come in twist gonna... them. We're all at the Last Supper, not <laughs> not the disciples. We're kind of sitting in, in the, the corner. Cynical, where you were kind of under or something, maybe hiding. I don't mm-hmm. know. Um, and Jesus lifts the, the the bread up and blesses it, and lifts the cup up and blesses uh-huh. it. Well, he hasn't died yet. Yeah. So are they eating his flesh? Absolutely. Huh? Absolutely. Because it is the timeless action. All right. Of Jesus. So So he could so we could we could have technically speaking, we could have had the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. It was the Eucharist. While Absolutely. hundred percent mm-hmm. it was mm-hmm. the Eucharist. Because I, I heard him say that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm asking this is, another question. This is my body. This is my blood. And and when you think of, you know, Jesus in his foreknowledge of what was coming. He's participating at a whole nother level of consciousness in his prayer life with the Father. Yeah. So he sees that this is the cup. Yep. He sees that this is the chalice and he is willing to drink of it. So his acceptance of what was the fruits of the crucifixion and his pierced side was right there in the chalice that he celebrated there. with the apostles. Interesting. Because it is the timeless mystical celebration right. of Holy Eucharist. That's interesting. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. That's a really good question. I've thought about that before, too. Yeah. Uh, good if you, want, if you want more information on that type of insight to what is being done liturgically in respect to the Eucharist, there's no greater ex- ex- explanation than what Joseph Ratzinger offered Pope Benedict the Sixteenth in the Spirit of the Liturgy. What a great as, book. As well as Jean Carbone, uh, The Wellspring of All Worship, two wonderful books on the liturgy that will open your eyes as Catholics to what is truly occurring mm-hmm. in that upper room with that sacred grail that is mystically present to you. So yes, if you want to go on a journey to see the true, the true grail, it is right there. So go in prayer and encounter Christ in that timeless reality. 
right. right. So before we go clomping out with our coconuts and mm-hmm. our African swallows and we go riding on horseback with uh, Sean Connery and the whole deal. Before we get onto that journey, why don't you tell everyone how they can connect with us and give a little shout out to our sponsors. So first and foremost, want to give a shout out to Exodus 90 and Covenant Eyes. We thank you so much for the sponsoring this show. They're a wonderful group of men and women who are truly remarkably changing the whole landscape of Christian practice. And in respect to Covenant Eyes, it's a software that gives you the ability to have accountability of overcoming pornography, overcoming different weaknesses that you may find yourself exploring different websites online that lead you astray and to lead you to a very unhealthy place. So the software Covenant Eyes is a wonderful way for you to have some support in overcoming some of these challenges and temptations. So be sure to go to CovenantEyes.com. And for this time period, you can actually go into and put in a promo code Catholic Talk and you'll get 30 days Full access to everything that they have, ebooks, resources, and again, that accountability ally that will help you overcome these challenges. Exodus 90, wonderful program for men, for you to journey through 90 days of self discipline and self mastery, living a life of prayer and contemplative asceticism, along with your brothers, over 90 days of, you know, really intense exercise in both body and spirit. You will be transformed in those 90 days into a new man. So check out Exodus90.com. And you could reach us as always through Catholic Talk Show on any of your web browsers. Certainly put in CatholicTalkShow.com and you'll see all the ways that you could listen in or view our show. And especially to our YouTube viewers, make sure that you subscribe and click the bell so that whenever we produce a video, it will arrive in your feed and you could follow whatever we're doing here in the studio and you Catholic Studios. And especially follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as we continue to post new things all the time, like how we got locked into the studio. That happened. Yeah, that did that did happen. So uh, until next week, my friends, let's be on that search. Let's be on that quest. And let's search for the Holy Grail.